So welcome everyone. You might have a question or anything that you brought along. So now is the time to ask. So we're not just discussing random stuff, but things that are of interest to you and important for you. Yes. So, um, I have a chaotic mind, like I like the meditation, um, it's not very easy to come back into having a clear mind. It's very, um, like a lot of stress in my life, like small stuff, it's just building, building, and like I'm always thinking about that. And, and um, I'm trying to be open minded with meditation, I'm trying to see dive into that world so that was my first time ever doing something like this so it's kind of you know it comes back to all the stresses like I'm trying to hold, close like think about my breathing but it's always like okay I got other stuff coming in my brain so almost like how do I begin like a baby how do I start yeah. walking this okay so the question essentially is you have a very crowded mind and you're just beginning the practice of meditation, a very stressful lifestyle, and um, you wonder how to ever make it back to the breath yeah. when everything is so apparently turbulent. Exactly. Well, the first quality, I would say, is persistence. It's like when you build your body, when you exercise, you bring that quite automatically. You expect to do repetitions at the gym, right? It's not that every repetition is a kind of a burden that you'd rather just immediately have the six-pack. Right? Some people, if you, if you draw a parallel here, you might say, well, I'm not going to the gym because I don't have a six-pack. Okay. That's the reason why we go to the gym. So we get a six-pack or we get strength or whatever it is that you're after. So this same attitude should be there with meditation practice. Consider it to be a training. In particular, in the beginning, you want to train just three, three things. One, you want to notice that you're distracted. That's the first thing. Just like every single time when you catch your mind, when you notice, ah, it's moving of its object. I forgot the breath. That's your first line of success you're already different from people who don't train their mind. Or people who are not training their mind, for them they don't even notice that they're distracted. <laughs> so here you have some success already. You notice, wow, I'm so distracted. I call it kind of like the first big insight. What a mess. <laughs> That's good news. If you notice that your house is dirty, then you have a fair chance you, you can now clean it up. If you notice you have a problem, great. Now you can fix it. If you don't even know that you have a problem, wow, this is bad news. So you complete the first step. But it's not just about completing it once, like coming to your first meditation class and going, oh, damn, I'm distracted. And that's that. But you need to recognize that throughout the day, again and again and again and again, every time your mind wanders off the breath, you need to catch it. And in the beginning, the mind will wander very far away from, from the breath, into all kinds of dreams and fiction. And then it will take a long time to, to actually notice it and catch it, because you're wandering into realms that are fascinating, interesting. 
like your mind serves you content that you would subscribe to. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're most likely to subscribe to your brain. Yeah. <laughs> because it's so captivating, we keep going from content into content, constantly chasing the next ideas about myself and my life and the world in which I live. It's like the ultimate video game, life. You constantly have some challenges coming your way, you have rewards, you have punishments, you can make so many decisions, you can move freely in this three-dimensional interactive world and you never know what's going to happen next. It's like the ultimate video game. Your body is like the ultimate avatar. And your mind, internally, there's so many menus and options and things you could do and think and all of it gives your life a different direction. This is what keeps people hooked into video games, by the way. It's just this endless possibilities. If you had a video game where you entered a room in which there was on the right corner there was a wrench and on the left side there was a door and you only thing you had to do is like use wrench open door done how many times would you play it and how many hours would you spend to it's like so limited there's no possibility whatsoever but your mind is so different it gives you all these scenarios so noticing that you're getting lost in these fascinating amazing enchanting worlds in your head takes a lot of practice. So please don't be frustrated that in the beginning when you get lost in your head a lot and deeply that it takes you like you might just wake up once a day or once a week in the beginning. It's good. You wake up. Then you want to train yourself in the beginning to just make that more, to wake up more often. To just notice like, oh, I forgot the breath for the last five hours. Completely forgot it. Come back to it. And here we come to the second stage, so the second training. Then after having recognized that your mind has wandered off, you then bring it back. The bringing it back itself, the remembering the object, that is mindfulness. That element. So when you notice that you're distracted, that's just the beginning of mindfulness kicking in. Mindfulness kicks in at that moment when you remember the breath. The word, the traditional word for mindfulness is sati. Sati means something like remembrance, recollection. So the mind actually performs the function of holding something. It, you hold something in mind. Here it's the breath. You wake up in the morning and you just set yourself one simple task. I want to notice when I lose the breath and then I want to return. And now when you return to the breath, that's half the game. Now you need to stay with the breath. That's the third training. That's a training of concentration. Or training of single-mindedness or stillness. You just keep your attention with the breath. And here in the beginning, particularly, I would just, and throughout your practice, I would just suggest be only with one breath. Can you be mindful for one in-breath? Like just simply breathing in, knowing that you're breathing in. Just that. Try. That's easy, right? Everyone in this room can do it. Everyone who's listening to this can do this. Breathing in. Knowing from the beginning to the end of the in-breath that, in, that you're breathing in. And then breathing out. Repeat. Do the same thing. Knowing that you're breathing out. Now try again. One more in-breath. And one out-breath. Just this one. Consider one in-breath um, a session of meditation. 
how many successful meditation sessions can you have during one big meditation session? Right? It's much more optimistic that way. It feels much more like, yeah, I can do that. It doesn't feel like, gosh, it's so overwhelming. I can't even be mindful for a minute. A minute is a lot of mindfulness. All those people who have some experience with meditation know what I'm talking about. Trying to be mindful for one entire minute is a lot. In fact, if you are able to manage that, you should drop quite deeply. So in the beginning, probably most people have the problem of expecting way too much. It's like the people that go to a yoga class saying like, oh, I don't think yoga is for me because I'm not flexible enough. <laughs> Same problem. It is for you, but you're not. If you expect to be flexible, like doing the splits with a, within a week, you will hate yoga. I think of stretching a millimeter more during a week, you will love it because you can achieve a goal. That's pretty good. So approach it like this, really small steps, one step after the other, not trying too much. And these three, we train these three muscles, recognizing distraction, bringing the mind back, and holding the mind with its object. I also want to say that when you hold your mind with, with the object, when you, when you concentrate on the breath, let's say, then you need to bring the right kind of attitude to this, to this practice of holding. It should not be tense. And that's difficult because you need to kind of find a nice balance between holding but without tension. So maybe the better word for that is relax into the breath or place the mind gently onto the breath like you would place a leaf onto a pond very very gently so whatever you do in your practice do with this kind of attitude of smiling of being kind to yourself if all the time in the world, all the patience in the world, see yourself with this power. You're ready to sit here for 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, and just do it for the sake of breathing. Just the sake of it. That's it. The goal is this breath. If you're waiting for something else to happen, like this is another obstacle, by the way, that many beginners face. It is this waiting for something to happen. Like I've been with the breath and I'm trying to focus on the breath for quite a while and I'm still waiting for something to happen. Your mind is so full of future that you cannot relax. It's so needy, there is so much craving still, you cannot settle. It's uncomfortable. There's striving. So you need to learn to let that go. And so all of us have to face these kind of inner problems. When we sit in meditation, we have to bring uh, a certain kind of intelligence to the practice that recognizes, oh, here I am blocking myself. And sometimes that takes years. You keep blocking yourself, you keep blocking yourself, you keep blocking yourself. And after five years of practice, you suddenly notice like, oh, I've been blocking myself there. <laughs> like every single time. And then the next step then is learning how to let go of blocking yourself. You spend a few more years with that. And then it slowly dissolves. And then the block is gone. And then you continue and you don't even notice how you're blocking yourself on a subtler level now. Until you recognize, oh, and it takes those years of practice until your eyes are becoming sharp enough to notice the block. That's the problem with... Uh, a lot of quick teachings, like get results fast. It doesn't allow your eyes to become sharp. So what can you expect to see if you're basically blind? So you need to sharpen the eyes and we, we do that over years of experience. And it happens when you stop waiting. 
That's one of the blocks. Waiting for something to happen. Drop it. This is happening right now. The, this breath. Let it be enough. Let this be enough. And quickly you will find that it's nice, it's peaceful. It's enough. It's good. And then you go deeper into that. Okay? Anything else? What has it brought you here? What is important for you? What are you seeking? So mindfulness is being focused on one topic or the... Mindfulness? Yeah. Okay, so the question is, is mindfulness being focused on one subject? Now that would be concentration. Mindfulness means keeping something in mind. Simple as that. For example, keeping the breath in mind or keeping kindness in mind throughout the day. So you remember a certain quality. You're mindful of that quality. You are remembering it. That's the, that's the quality of mindfulness. The quality of focus it is much more a quality of stillness. Mindfulness, however, leads to focus. It leads to concentration. If the mindfulness becomes more and more, um, how do you say, if it lines up, you have one moment of mindfulness, another moment of mindfulness, they connect, and more and more, then you enter a state of stillness, of concentration. But then there is no more holding in mind, the mind becomes still. But still, like, focus on one thing, on the main, as you explain it, like, in your know, daily life, you know, like many things in your head, and then you're mindful, you kind of loosen it up, it's not really concentrated on all of it. You know. Do you mean so like... you concentrate on your breath, and then you mind yeah. so You're mindful then of the breathing. Thing, yeah. Yes. Or there's still things going through your head, and all that's not supposed to happen in all of it. Like, yeah, well... When you're concentrating on your breath... Yes. And you have... Going by. Yes. Are you mindful then or not? <laughs> Are you mindful then or not? Or, uh, what do you call it? Hmm. Are you mindful then or not? See, you know the activity that you do, right? Let's say you're with the breath mm -hmm. and you're concentrated on the breathing. You follow it. You know the in-breath. You know the out-breath. And there are thoughts still appearing, but further away from you in the distance, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's say that. It's not really a black and white thing. It's the problem with words. Words make it like a very stuck, kind of very limited black and white sharp border thing. It's then an increase of concentration and mindfulness over at the breath and a decrease in your attention going out. So it's a gradual stilling of the attention with the breath. But now, if I'm describing these kind of things, then some scholars might come up and say, wait a second, the definition of mindfulness and this and that. So we create problems. The mind, what, what happens in your mind when you sit and you meditate? That's, that's what's interesting. Like besides calling it anything, you're with the breath, the breath becomes more pronounced, more strongly in your experience, and the thoughts go into the background. That is right. You're going the right direction. You're becoming more absorbed in the breath, so to speak. And why can you do that? Because you're keeping the breath in mind. There's this holding quality of mindfulness. Now, is that concentration? Is that focus? Ah. I don't really know. <laughs> I don't really know. But um, it works like this, yeah. The, the mechanics are like this. Mm. 
Mindfulness is that quality which enables you not to forget the breath. It stays there. The opposite of mindfulness is heedlessness or forgetfulness. You forget the breath and you get lost in all kinds of things. Concentration can arise, like let's say, even without like a particular intention to, to hold an object. Let's we'll say you're watching a beautiful sunset and you kind of get concentrated on it. It's really nice and if everything else fades away, you're getting concentrated on it. But there is no intention to keep it in mind, in a way. You're not like trying to keep something in mind. A practice of mindfulness does that. So we also, there's a distinction between right mindfulness and wrong mindfulness. For example, right mindfulness is that kind of mindfulness which leads to release, to freedom, to inner freedom, to peace. Wrong mindfulness would be a kind of mindfulness that would lead to more excitement, more problems, more steering up. Like you could be mindful of, let's say, you're kind of a foodie, you're sitting in meditation and then you're mindful of dinner. You're constantly bringing dinner back into your attention, you're holding on to dinner, you're contemplating dinner, you're, it's like you're in this context of dinner there and you're holding that in mind. That is mindfulness, but it doesn't lead to peace. Yeah. So it doesn't, it doesn't lead to stillness or something. Yeah. It quickly, quickly, words become problematic. That's why reading books and so forth is often, it's confusing people even more. So you have to practice, do the work, and then see what happens. And... As you can, is that your experience? That when you concentrate on the breath, everything fades to the background? No, I still have thoughts. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, of course, but it's further away. Yeah. Good, that's good. good. So keep going, strengthen the, the experience of being with the breath, and let go of everything else, let it fall away even more, until it stops. And there's only the breath left. So practice needs to become more deep then. Okay, yes? Um, I'm used to overthinking scenarios like crazy, especially in this constellation with people. Like my job is sometimes good, but in private relationships it's difficult because I always try to be prepared as best as possible even if it's crazy. Yes. So could meditation help to, to be, because when I'm sitting here it's working good to be focused on my breath. I think to get the mind more quiet over the day would be great because sometimes it just gets crazy. So much overthinking about everything. <laughs> well, okay. So the problem is overthinking throughout the day. Then the practice has to be throughout the day with a firm intention to constantly come back to the breath. It's, just, it's really simple, which is good news. Nothing complicated you need to do. Just keep the breath in mind. Every time you catch yourself overthinking, gently return to the breath, and then you need to learn to let that content of your thoughts fall away. There's a few contemplations that can help us to let it fall away more easily. For most people, in the beginning, it's really difficult to let, because it's important, it's urgent, right? You're subscribed again. So it's, it's like... It demands your immediate attention now, and you need to solve it. Otherwise, you're going to suffer in the future if you're not solving that now. So it's hard to let that go. Because very often it's almost as if our life depended on this thought construct. So maybe it helps to have a few steps prior to that to contemplate first, before you are able to give yourself the permission to drop it. Let it fall away. What I often think is, particularly with thoughts about 
future and so forth. What helps me is to think, I will die. Everybody will die. Everything will go away. And to enter that thought so deeply and to keep my mind, to keep my mind mindful of death and to contemplate today could be my last day. Until you reach a... You feel it's so uncertain that you survive today, you need to feel that uncertainty. It'll be easy to drop the thoughts after that. Sometimes life reminds you of that uncertainty. The, the, the virus going around at the moment is one of those reminders of how unstable things are. We just don't know what's going to happen. But there is this pesky feeling of, I'm safe. That's at the root of that. So we think we have time to think about stuff. That doesn't matter. Yes? So that's one of those thoughts. Another one? Another one that really helps me is this, based on this story, Good, Bad, Who Knows. I'm not going to retell the story, and I've told it, told it so many times, and you can find it online for sure. Good, bad, who knows? Um, we simply don't know what things will turn into. Like, you, you form that scenario in your head, thinking it through, thinking, okay, if I got the job, that would be awesome. It's a very simple kind of thought. Now, are you sure? This is a bit like saying, if I just shifted my legs, that will be awesome. Is that true or not? Like your legs are in pain, super painful. So if you shifted your legs, it'll be nice, right? Good, so you shift your legs. What happens next? Yeah. The posture is the best kind of thing to, to describe life. If you look at your posture and your body, it's in constant motion because it's always uncomfortable. And if you change it, then it, it's a short moment, there's a relief, it's nice, then you change it again. Please observe that, yeah? As you're changing right now, all of you, like um, there's an itch, you scratch, and then you wait, and you see something else will happen. And it's, life is like that. Your body is life. It shows you how life is. So what are your hopes concerning the body? Do you hope that y you will one day find the right posture? No, right? So it makes you kind of like um, renounce. And like, why would I worry about things that will not give me happiness? Instead, they will just give me more of the same. Why would I think about them? And then you drop them. Both of these, are they work for me. Maybe you find another reason why thoughts are not worthy of holding. I don't know yet, I, I can't say with certainty, whether there are thoughts worthy of holding. I'm not too sure about that. So far I haven't found any. So, there are states that are beautiful to embody but thoughts that are worthy of holding, I'm not sure. I don't know. And then your experience might be a third point to, to reflect on. What's your experience with thinking? Where does it end you up? It never stops. Good. So you practice what I call seeing the future. It's like, okay... Okay, if I continue thinking like this, where will I end up? More healthy or more stressed? More happy or more burdened? Right? And then, oh, you have another permission. Okay, I don't need to do this anymore. So you drop it. All these three kind of 
approaches are there to loosen the grip a little bit, so then you can drop it. It's almost like um, maybe a good picture would be you have this deliciously looking food in front of you. It looks amazing, smells good, and you want to dig in. And then a friend comes and says, hold on a second, I've seen the kitchen. Can I describe the kitchen to you real quick? And then he starts to describe the kitchen and he says, well, there were maggots. Um, the, the, the kitchen was basically infested with rats, cockroaches everywhere, including on your plate before they brought it out. What happens with the food? It smells good, it looks great. Would you still eat it? No. If you analyze your thoughts and what they do to you on a consistent basis, you lose your appetite and you click unsubscribe very fast. <laughs> okay? Yeah. All right, I think that's good enough for today. It's eight. So thank you very much for coming. Have a good night, sweet weekend.